All right, everybody. Welcome back. I hope uh, you got at least a little bit of a spring break. Um, and uh, we will um, continue where we left off a little bit here. Um, and as we go, um, let's uh, start by remembering a little bit where we were. So um, we were talking about IO devices and among other things, we uh, sort of put up this mental model of how a processor might talk to a device. So for instance, there's always a memory bus um, uh, that's often directly off the chip, but then there's typically a set of bus adapters um, and an interrupt controller. We sort of were talking about what a typical device controller is. The device controller is the part that interfaces with the main system and the device. And um, the CPU interacts with the controller to control the device, as we stated. And so typically a device controller has uh, a couple of possible interfaces, one uh, of which is a, a set of registers that you can read and write that uh, might control the device. And those registers are, um, on x86 devices at least, controlled with um, reads and writes to uh, special instructions, using special instructions. Or we might actually have memory mapped uh, regions where we just read and write actual addresses and the um, control goes directly out to the device. So uh, this may contain memory for requests, uh, queues, or maybe bitmapped image uh, memory, et cetera, on this controller. Every device is a little different. But um, no matter how complicated things are, um, there's typically two ways of accessing things, as I mentioned here. One is with I.O. instructions. So I.O. instructions typically uh, look like this, where uh, you might have an out uh, instruction to OX21 with uh, register AL. And what this says is uh, whatever contents uh, is in register AL actually gets sent out to uh, port 21. And that port 21 goes over a special IO bus and that might end up reading or writing some control register. Um, alternatively, which is uh, much more common, we have memory mapped IO where again, just reading and writing through load and store instructions goes directly to the hardware uh, and causes IO to happen. <laughs> Excuse me. So just as giving an example of those memory mapped displays, we uh, or of a memory mapped IO, we sort of said, well, here might be an example of a display with IO addresses that are physical addresses. Um, and if I read and write in certain ranges, I might actually update uh, what the command I want to run, or I might uh, read the status. Or if I happen to write to uh, say a set of addresses that might put bits on the screen, or perhaps I might actually put commands into a graphics queue to uh, draw triangles. And so, um, you know, in general, what memory mapping means is the hardware maps control registers and control and display memory and so on to actual addresses. In the old days, the addresses were actually set by hardware jumpers at boot time, although these days you plug it in and what happens typically is um, these uh, addresses are picked automatically so they don't um, conflict with other devices. And just writing to memory with a, with a write instruction or a store instruction would actually cause something to happen. So here we're writing to the frame buffer. Um, we might write uh, graphics commands to the command queue, um, et cetera. Um, we might write to the command register and the result of writing to that actually causes the device to act on what we've said, et cetera. And so this is just a, uh, a simple example of a memory map device. Uh, memory map devices are very common these days because they're uh, very simple to interface and you don't need special processor support like you do with IO instructions. And um, depending on what part of the physical space these are mapped to, you can also also typically protect this with address translation in a way where you can even give full control of a device up to a user by mapping their page tables to map to a certain part of the physical space. Okay, that's kind of where we were last time. Uh, what we didn't uh, get to too much was talking about this process of transferring data to and from the actual controller itself. And if you look for instance, programmed I.O. is one option where each byte is transferred by the processor, uh, either by using in and out instructions or by loads and stores. And uh, this in, is very processor heavy. So the processor is in a loop. And if you're going to transfer four kilobytes of data, it's in a loop that's uh, 
pulling each byte in. Um, now maybe it's doing it uh, four bytes at a time by loading uh, a 32-bit word, but it's still extremely processor intensive. Uh, the pros of this are it's very simple hardware and it's easy to program and the processor is involved. Um, the cons are that it consumes processor cycles. Now we have a question here about, well, for working with memory mapped devices, how do you tell the processor that those regions are memory mapped and so reads may have side effects? Uh, is it set at the hardware design time or is there configuration? So that's a good question. So uh, typically there are parts of the physical address space which are um, outside of where the DRAM is that's known by the, the um, system itself to be IO uh, addresses. And so when you plug in uh, a device into like a, PCR, a PCI slot or whatever, there are, there's a configuration process whereby you can say, well, certain reads and writes to physical uh, addresses end up going to that card instead of going to DRAM. And so you could say this is set at hardware design time. It's really a combination of certain parts of the address space are reserved for I.O. and you plug a card in and you use that part of that I.O. Um, I don't know if that answered that question. Going back to this slide, by the way, uh, what you see here is that certain addresses going on this processor memory bus may go to DRAM and regular memory, or they may go over bus adapters and end up doing the memory mapped devices. So I don't know, I'm hoping that answered that question. Um, so uh, the alternative is uh, what we call direct memory access. And what direct memory access is, this is the alternative to programmed IO, is that um, the processor just sets up the transfer and then something else goes through a loop and transfers things. Um, so we're gonna give a controller access to the memory bus and ask it to transfer the blocks by itself. And the, um, the good thing about this is that now the processor is not involved in transferring every byte. And instead it gets a signal like an interrupt when, it's, uh, when the transfer is complete. So here's an example uh, from uh, one of the books that you guys have access to where it uh, kind of shows what happens if we're gonna try to do, use DMA to pull something off of a disk. Uh, so for instance, the first thing is the CPU is gonna uh, go into the kernel and tell the uh, device driver that it wants to transfer disk data from a certain part of a disk. Um, what happens is that uh, driver then tells the uh, disk controller um, by going over the memory bus that uh, that transfer needs to happen. The disk controller, in this instance might end up reaching up to a DMA controller, which is on the bus, programming it to say, well, for every byte or uh, every 32 bits you get, um, transfer it to the next slot of memory. And uh, part of that is the uh, sort of the starting address of where it's getting transferred. And then what happens is uh, the disk controller then starts sending data through the DMA controller, the DMA controller writes memory, and then when it's done, the DMA controller uh, interrupts. Okay, and so the key thing here is that there's this other piece of hardware involved in doing the transfers rather than having the CPU do the transfers. Okay, and uh, there are many instances of how DMA works. Uh, certain buses, for instance, like the USB bus, et cetera, um, uh, actually allow the devices themselves to be bus masters and, and write directly into memory. And so there, there might be essentially a DMA controller on every device, for instance, under some circumstances. Okay, are there any questions on that? So the question is, could normal CPU software offload accesses to DMA? Uh, so I'm not entirely sure as opposed to an external device doing so. So under, um, depends on the device, if I understand the question here, um, the CPU might program the DMA controller. If you have a memory map device, the CPU might actually control, uh, program a, an independent DMA controller and then the DMA controller reads from one address and writes to memory or reads from memory and writes to a, an IO address. And so there are many variants of DMA out there some of them on cards, some of them uh, on buses, et cetera. Um, so now how does a device notify the OS that uh, transfer is done? Well, um, basically, or that it needs service. And so we've talked about a couple of options here. Um, reasons that this might need to happen is for instance, the device has completed a DMA operation or uh, there's an error or there's a packet coming in off the network. 
And of course, we've talked a lot about interrupts at the early part of the class. And so this is a case where the um, device generates an interrupt whenever it needs service. And uh, the CPU then goes into an interrupt handler and uh, starts doing something. So typically, the bottom half of the device driver is entirely interrupt driven, and it gets entered when an interrupt occurs. So the pros of this are that um, the CPU doesn't necessarily have to know how long it's going to take for the transfer to finish. All it does is it um, just waits for the interrupt, and it does something completely different. And when the interrupt comes, then the kernel handles things. Uh, an alternative, though, is what's called polling. And this is a case where the OS periodically actually checks a device-specific register to see whether it's got a bit set saying that the transfer is done. Now, if you remember, the, the downside of an interrupt is that uh, you have to save all of the state of whatever was running before, and then you've got to set up the interrupt handler and get a new stack frame and so on, and then run, and then you've got to restore the state. So there's some uh, non-trivial interrupt error uh, handler um, cost to an interrupt. With polling, potentially, you can be just checking the register every now and then just by reading a bit out of memory uh, I.O. space. And as a result, there's a much lower overhead to recognizing that there's a um, service to happen. Now, there's a question about how do you maintain coherency with DMA? That's a really great question. And uh, back to the DMA here. Um, what the issue here might be that if there's part of memory that is in your cache and you're overwriting it, what happens? And that depends a lot on the devices. Some devices actually, um, or some uh, systems, and, and that includes CPU systems, automatically invalidate memory when the DMA controller writes it. Others, the CPU has to go and flush uh, the cache before it can start a DMA operation to get coherence. Um, the, uh, so um, actual devices, going back to the uh, IO interrupts and polling, actual devices uh, combine both polling and interrupts at the same time. Um, because, for instance, uh, if you've got a really high bandwidth network device, like a 10 gigabit or 100 gigabit per second network device, if you took an interrupt every time a packet came in, you would uh, actually spend all of your time saving and restoring registers. Fortunately, um, IOs tends to come in bursts. And so what typically happens with a high performance driver is it, the interrupt takes it into the driver. And then uh, the d device driver keeps emptying packets out of the network controller, for instance, until there aren't any left. So it's doing polling to see uh, if there's any packets left. And then eventually it re-enables interrupts and exits back to user code. And so this is a way of basically handling uh, really high bandwidth items with a combination of interrupts and polling. OK. So um, are there any questions on that? The other time when you're using polling, by the way, is uh, th so there's a question here about how you do I.O. in real time situations. So one of the issues with real time is typically you don't want to interrupt your running processes because they're carefully um, timed, right? You've got uh, exact deadlines and you know exactly what the time is. And so that's an ideal place where a second CPU that's not running your real time tasks is watching for I.O. And in that case, oftentimes, if you have a spare CPU, what will happen is you'll do a polling situation where that CPU is just in a very tight loop, and it's just checking registers for uh, waiting I.O. And so uh, the real answer to how you deal with real time and uh, somewhat unpredictable reality is you um, separate, use separate processors, one that's doing the, uh, doing the real time processing and the other, which is checking the I.O. And polling is often used in those situations if you can burn a CPU just to spin in a loop looking for I.O. Now, we talked about this back in uh, earlier in the term where we talked about the fact that device drivers are the thing that allows the kernel to deal with a wide variety of different devices. And it's basically uh, device-specific code in the kernel that interacts with the device and as a result provides a standardized interface up into the kernel. And um, as a result, the same parts of the kernel I.O. subsystem can interact easily with different devices because of the standardized interface. Uh, and that standardized interface, of course, has what we um, keep in mind, things like uh, 
read, um, write, open, close, et cetera. Okay. And so, um, let me just close this and. Um, so, uh, in addition to the standard IO, by the way, there's the uh, special device specific configuration is this IOCTAL system call. So you might do an open to a device and it has read and write system calls, but it also might have an IOCTAL call because different devices might have different options that you need to program. Okay, and so example might be a device uh, that displays something might have different resolutions you could set. Um, or uh, a network card might have different uh, speeds or a serial device might have different speeds and it's possible that you would do that with an IOCTAL system call in terms of programming it. Um, the device drivers have these two halves that we've been talking about. Um, the top half is what your uh, user code uh, accesses. When it comes in, um, you get a call path from system calls and that's where the standard sort of open read write IOCTAL strategy calls are. And this is the kernel's interface to the device driver. And it's also the place that will start uh, IO and maybe put the thread or process to sleep if necessary. The bottom half is the part that runs as an interrupt routine when the data is back. Okay, and so I showed you this earlier, but I wanted to talk you through it again. So this user program might actually have um, IO that it wants to do. And so it does a, a read system call. And uh, that system call crosses into the kernel uh, via the system call boundary. And at that point, it might say, well, can I satisfy this read already? And uh, a good example of that might be a file system where I try to do a read, and the kernel has a cache of blocks off the disk. Uh, we'll talk a lot about that uh, coming up very shortly in the next lecture or so. But um, if the answer is yes, then potentially it can transfer the data into the user's buffer and uh, return from the system call very quickly. On the other hand, if that can't happen, then um, we might have to send a request down to the device driver. And this is a point where the device control comes into play. Uh, so we enter the top half of the device driver, and what it would do is it might say, well, I know what block is necessary. And in those instances, if I know what block is necessary, then um, I uh, issue the commands to the actual controller itself telling the disk, for instance, to scan into a certain track and then read a certain sector. And then um, I might actually end up having to put the process to sleep uh, because at that point, there's nothing else I can do. So I'll put the process to sleep on a sleep queue. And of course, the scheduler will take over and wake somebody up. We talked about that earlier. Um, and then what happens? Well, we've actually sent a command down to the hardware. And so in the case of a disk, which is we're going to talk about later this lecture, um, it might actually just start. Uh, doing the access and eventually that will finish and that access will complete and generate an interrupt uh, and then that's when the bottom half of the device driver takes over and that bottom half will receive the interrupt uh, store the data in the device driver buffer if it's inter interrupt and then uh, signal to unblock the device driver and that signal at that point after we've done the transfer will um, figure out who asked for the I.O. and which process to wake up, uh, and, that, and it'll copy the data into maybe the file system in that case, and we'll wake up our process, and then we'll transfer the data from the file system into the user's buffer, and then we'll return from the system call possibly a lot later. So this, this long path, which we took here, could uh, involve you know, milliseconds, or even seconds in some very slow I.O. before we go from the original system call to having woken things up and uh, returned from the read call. And so this is the blocking read call path. All right, questions? Ah, so the question here is why does Windows seem to have much more issues with device drivers as opposed to uh, Mac OS or Linux? I think uh, the real answer to that would uh, have to be the wider variety of possible devices that are out there. Um, so uh, both um, Apple and to some extent, well, so Apple basically had a restricted set of devices and so they had much higher control over their device drivers. Linux, um, while it does support a wide range of devices, tends to have a lot of people that find bugs and so on. And so it tends to have um, more stable 
device driver code. And Windows tends to have lots of devices and lots of third parties writing code, which tends to lead to uh, possibly more failure. Uh, I will point out, though, that um, when device driver bugs happen, they do uh, cause major problems with the kernel. And there are device driver problems in, in Mac OS and Linux as well. Um, but uh, it is possibly true that Windows has more. But I think that's partially, partially because there are more things available and so less control over who's writing the device drivers. Now, um, so let's uh, take a brief uh, stop here and, and talk a little bit about some performance concepts because we are, are kind of getting close to the device uh, interface here and we might ask ourselves things like, uh, if we're trying to figure out whether a device is performing well, what might we care about? Well, one option might be response time or latency. That's the time to perform actual operations. Another might be bandwidth or throughput, which is the rate of operations per unit time. So latency is the time for a single operation. Uh, rate at which operations are performed is uh, a bandwidth or throughput question. And uh, remember when we were doing scheduling, response time and bandwidth uh, were sort of opposite sides of the coin and uh, optimizing for one didn't always optimize for the other. And you know, good examples of bandwidth or throughput are things, they're typically measured in things like megabytes per second or uh, that's for files or for networks might be megabits per second or uh, arithmetic operations uh, might be gigaflops per second if you were talking to, um, to an NVIDIA uh, graphics card or something like that. Um, another important uh, performance question is startup or overhead, which is the time to initiate an operation. Now, um, all three of these items are actually uh, present in uh, typical devices. There's a certain startup time, there's a certain throughput of uh, bytes per second or whatever you get out, and then, um, uh, excuse me, there's a certain startup time, there's a throughput, and that leads to the latency for operations. And so we can actually come up with a uh, basic model that's uh, not too bad, which says kind of the latency in uh, of, uh, a byte, in total number of bytes to transfer, so this is some size, might be a file size or a network block size, is typically the overhead uh, plus bytes over the transfer speed or capacity. And so um, the overhead is kind of a guaranteed uh, not to exceed base latency. And so as you can see from this essentially linear relationship, uh, as the size of the operation we're trying to do goes towards zero, we converge to the overhead. And so uh, a bigger size in a transfer has a tendency to swamp the overhead. Once you get something big enough, then you can ignore the overhead. And so a good example of this uh, might be a really fast network uh, or a fast network, which is like a gigabit per second link which by the way is 125 megabytes per second. So one gigabit per second is 125 megabytes per second. And let's say there's a startup cost of a millisecond getting into the controller uh, to transfer something. And so we could get a graph like this, where um, I have actually two separate uh, units on the same graph just for uh, convenience. So um, the blue is the latency of an operation uh, and the, the, uh, the red is the bandwidth. And if we look here for a moment, this is the length of, say, the packet I'm sending. And what's interesting about this is as the length gets bigger, there's a linear uh, time to transfer, but we always have this overhead. So the initial overhead here of a, mega, a millisecond, we can't get around. And so as uh, we grow this uh, length, then um, as we grow the length, then this uh, linear time increases and that uh, overhead becomes less and less important. There is a question here about why network stuff's always in bits. Uh, <laughs> the answer uh, for why networking is typically in bits is that networks are usually uh, serial uh, um, communication devices and so that's a bit uh, per time. And so basically bits per second uh, basically relate to the fact that you're sending kind of bits at a time um, as opposed to serial um, this is as opposed to sort of a parallel device that might send bytes at a time. Um, so now the question is, um, I'm not sure, is bandwidth the same as transfer capacity? Uh, yes, in the previous slide it is. Um, and um, this question about, is this because the packet size doesn't really also increase? Are you asking about the shape of this graph? Uh, 
let me explain the graph. We haven't finished this yet here. So, um, so if you look, if you notice here that um, for latency, we sort of have our overhead s plus the uh, number of bytes we're trying to send over the bandwidth in uh, megabytes per second. Notice I've uh, transferred to my units, um, and so uh, hopefully this makes sense to everybody. As we have a bigger and bigger packet, we can transfer that uh, at full speed once we've gotten in the overhead of getting into the controller. So that's what this uh, overhead typically is. The bandwidth is this uh, red curve. And the way to think about bandwidth, this is an effective bandwidth, is to say that it's the size of what I'm transferring divided by the amount of time it takes to transfer. And hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Um, as I get down towards zero, I have this overhead, which is basically wasted time. And so it doesn't matter how fast the network is, as I get down to smaller and smaller packets, um, I basically have a very low effective bandwidth. But as I um, increase the packet size, the overhead means less and less. And so eventually I get closer and closer up here to the bandwidth of uh, what I'm, uh, of my network. And notice that my network's 125 megabytes per second. And um, this one is you know, not quite crossing 100. And as the packet size got bigger and bigger, I would get a, uh, closer to my 125, okay? Now, um, in fact, if you look here, um, we can even continue this a little further and we can ask something about the half power bandwidth, which is the point at which my effective bandwidth is about half of what, at least half of what my network bandwidth is. Um, and so if we do that computation, we can see here that I have to have 125,000 <coughs> bytes of data before uh, in packet size before I kind of get to half of the full bandwidth of the network. And so um, what's the lesson out of this? Well, the lesson out of this is you may have a really fast communication uh, channel, but because of the overheads of using it, it may be that you don't get all those bytes. You're spending a lot of time with packet overhead. Okay, and so the bigger the packets, typically uh, the closer you get to the full bandwidth. All right. Now, um, what's interesting about this, just to show the uh, importance of overhead, is if instead of a one uh, millisecond overhead, we go for a 10 millisecond startup, which is more like disk. What you see here is, um, here's 10 milliseconds or 10,000 microseconds. Uh, same gigabit uh, speed of the d transfer device, but the half power point is uh, 1.25 uh, megabytes before we even get to using half of our, of our um, bandwidth. And that's because this overhead's so high. So um, what you can see from this is uh, in a disk, you're gonna waste most of the speed of the disk unless you can somehow get this overhead to go away. And uh, the biggest way we're gonna get the overhead to go, to go away on a disk is with our file system, we're going to try to uh, avoid seek time, which is the thing that's in milliseconds and try to mostly uh, read things that are um, sequential off of disk, all right? Now, did I answer that question, uh, Sebastian? I'll assume the answer is yes. Okay, great. So, so what determines this peak bandwidth? So I talked about peak bandwidth might be a gigabit per second for a link. Well, you know, that's the speed of the bus. So uh, you could look at a bunch of buses. So things like PCIX might have one, uh, you know, one mega or thousand megabytes per second. Um, and that's because there's many lanes running at a, a reasonable speed. There might be ultra wide SCSI, which is 40 megabytes per second. Um, things that are kind of interesting is uh, USB 3.0 is more like five gigabits per second. Uh, Thunderbolt, which is uh, the USB-C uh, is 40 gigabits per second. And so these have been growing quite a bit. I also put these SASs in here. So if you buy a serial drive and plug it into a device, um, and you get a device that's like SAS3, we can actually get 12 gigabits per second coming off of a disk drive, which is pretty fast. Um, so uh, bus speeds are clearly gonna determine the peak bandwidth. Um, and so the other things that are gonna determine how fast we can get is the device itself. So the bus might be really fast, but if the device is slow, it doesn't help you much, right? So um, for instance, the rotational speed of the disk, if you've got a really high speed disk because you're in the cloud, 
you might have 15,000 um, revolutions per minute. If you've got a, a low power device in your laptop, you might have 3,600 to try to save uh, battery power. Okay, or things like the read write rate of NAND flash might matter, or the signaling rate of a network link. Okay, so these uh, these things can um, impact basically what you're going to get, and it may not just be the bus. So whatever is the bottleneck in the path is the thing that slows everything down. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about storage devices uh, because that'll be our our first kind of canonical device that we examine a little more detail. Um, there's at least two types of devices that you use probably every day. So one is magnetic disk. The magnetic disk is, uh, is very reliable storage. It very rarely becomes corrupted, uh, very large capacity at low cost. Uh, buying uh, four terabyte drives these, these days is almost a no brainer. You know, 16 terabytes, whatever, not a big deal. Um, it's block level random access, uh, except for uh, shingle magnetic uh, recording, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So basically you can go and pretty much get any block from anywhere on the disk. It's just very slow because you've got to seek and rotate to get to it. So the performance for random access is very slow, much better performance for sequential access. So these properties are going to greatly impact the way that file systems are designed to operate on disks. And we'll talk about how file systems have grown over the years to adapt to uh, these constraints. The fact that you basically want to do sequential access pretty much all the time. Um, flash memory, which has become uh, much more common these days, is uh, again very reliable. It, it wasn't originally, it's much more reliable now. Um, it's got a capacity that's not as cheap as magnetic disks, although that keeps changing, getting better. Uh, block level random access, just like with uh, disk, really good performance for reads, uh, worse for writes. So writes actually uh, take time to, to cause the change in uh, magnetic levels and, um, and power, okay? Uh, you have to erase large blocks. You can only write a block once and then you have to erase it first before you can write it again. So that actually causes some issues with file systems. And then with the other thing with flash memory is it wears out. Uh, so if you write a given block on flash memory too much, it actually gets to where it doesn't uh, store data anymore and then your device is dead. Um, so, or at least that block is dead. So that's a, a, a downside of flash memory. The upside is, uh, much faster in general than disk, the random access is great. And, uh, you know, and overall it's a pretty low power solution. So I don't know uh, how many of you have ever opened up a disk drive or looked inside, but um, it's pretty fascinating technology. Uh, it's a series of platters um, and the data is stored in concentric tracks uh, and, um, the, uh, the question here that we have, by the way, is if a block dies, does a storage device know this and avoid storing stuff at that block in the future? So the answer is that the device actually can tell that the block is, is uh, starting to fail. And in fact, it, um, uh, there's explicit something called wear leveling that uh, is, tries to spread the, the writes all over the blocks to try to make them fail less uh, frequently. But yes, there are. Um, actual codes on the disk to help uh, on the blocks and the flash to notice that things are failing. So with a with a hard disk drive that's it's spinning storage, these heads are extremely uh, sophisticated. So the the tip of the head uh, actually requires the same kind of patterning that they do on chips themselves, um, and uh, is uh, very sophisticated. And for a long time, only IBM was capable of making these things. Um, it's interesting when you start looking at the original uh, IBM uh, personal computer AT in 1986 that a uh, 30 megabyte hard disk was 500 bucks. Okay, 30 megabyte. Okay, it had a 30 to 40 millisecond seek time, and uh, and it could get about a megabyte per second off of of a spindle. Things are a lot faster now. I'll show you some up to date timings in a second, but uh, quite a bit faster. I also wanted to show you these cool little devices, which uh, I actually even had some. These were, they fit into cameras that took this size of flash memory, but they were little spinning disk drives inside there. So there was a single platter 
There was a, uh, two heads on either side that um, spun on either side of the disc. And um, for the time, these were actually bigger than what you could get in flash. So this is an actual four gigabyte uh, device inside what looks like a flash chip, believe it or not. Pretty cool. Uh, the other thing I did want to mention is these heads have, uh, have a read-write head on both sides of the platter. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, we, uh, we read both sides of the disk, and there's, uh, and there's a head on either side of the platter for each platter. OK. And by the way, these uh, micro drives were made by both IBM and Hitachi at the time. Uh, they were pretty amazing, but they were only lasted for a short period of time because flash uh, densities caught up with them very quickly, and they became uh, impractical and not cost effective anymore. So what about disks? OK, so here's a, here's a little bit of a, uh, another version of a disk here to look at. So if we have a platter, OK, that's this. There's a surface. There's two surfaces for every platter. There's a series of platters. There's two heads uh, for each side. And then there's this arm, which um, as a unit basically scans in to a certain spot on the platters. And so you have a series of platters and a series of heads, and they're all tied together. Okay. And so uh, when you move from the outside into a particular track, it's only possible uh, to move all the heads at once. Okay. Now, <laughs> the unit of transfer here is a sector. There it is. Uh, that's the smallest unit that can come off a disk. And uh, as I mentioned, um, I think in one of the Piazza posts or whatever, uh, the sector size is, is kind of irrelevant to, to today's uh, operating systems because it's relatively small. It's like 512 bytes. And you never want to transfer only 512 bytes. And so typically, these sectors are put together into a block. And that's where a 4K block comes from. OK, um, if you take a ring that's a track and you look at all the tracks in a, that are uh, in, together above each other, that's called a cylinder. So it's kind of like if you took a, a tin can and you went straight through all of the platters, you would find all of the tracks in a cylinder. And so the head positions on a cylinder and then a particular arm is or a particular head is activated to read or write at that point. So disk tracks are uh, very narrow okay microns wide or less um, so this is you know the wavelength of light in this case is 0.5 uh, micrometers in typical human eye uh, size and so we're basically uh, very small relative to the size of uh, of the heads there's a question here does the arm zigzag back and forth to read a single sector no so what happens uh, that's a very good question because this is a bad figure I'm realizing what happens is this whole system is spinning. And so all that has to happen is the arm has to go to a particular cylinder, and then all of the data goes over, or the arm goes over all the data as the platters are spinning. So these platters spin, and as a result, the whole track traces out, and uh, the head basically gets to read or write potentially the whole track. Or if it's interested in a particular sector, what will happen is it, it, the uh, arm goes in, and then you have to wait until. Uh, until the track or the sector goes under the head, and then you can read and write it. OK. Um, so uh, there's guard regions on either, either side to uh, help in the, um, if you have single tracks, to help sort of avoid corrupted data during writes. Um, although uh, what's kind of interesting is it's a little different these days. I'll talk about shingled magnetic recording in a moment. But so the track length varies. Uh, across the disk. And so if you think about this a little bit, if the arm is out at the outside of the disk, there's a lot more disk surface that goes by than on the inside. That's just, uh, you know, that's just basically the circumference that's, uh, that's acting here. And, and so what does that mean? Well, that means essentially that um, the, uh, the sectors are all the same density because you want to store bits at a given density on the disk. And so that means that as the arms are on the, when the arms are on the outside, the sectors are going by a lot faster than when they're on the inside. And so the data rate actually varies uh, on the outside versus the inside to make sure that the data is stored at a constant aerial density. 
okay? Um, and what's other, the other thing that's kind of interesting here is that um, these disks, regular disks are getting so big that the time to read a whole disk is becoming too long to even back up. And so oftentimes these days, companies like Google will have part of the disk is actually used for active data and the rest is used for archival storage that's almost never touched. Okay, and so they actually kind of split the disk into two pieces, th those that are um, archival and those that are active. And that's just because the active data, if it needs to be backed up somewhere, you just, you can't read that active data off uh, fast enough to uh, kind of make sure it's safe, all right? Now, the other thing I wanted to mention is for really, really high density, uh, what they do today is they do what's called shingled magnetic recording. And these are disks that are entirely for sequential reads. These do really poorly at, uh, at random reads, and I'll show you why. If you look, the track, uh, the head that's writing actually writes a wider swath than the track itself. And so what happens here is you write uh, one track, and then the next time around in the next track, you're actually overwriting the previous track somewhat. This is shingled. So this looks like shingles on a roof of a house. And so um, you might ask yourself, how the heck uh, do you ever read the data afterwards? And the answer is really good uh, digital signal processing, <laughs> OK? And so the earliest first versions of, for instance, Seagate 8 terabytes and Hitachi 10 terabytes actually used shingled magnetic recording to get the high density. Um, the density uh, improvements have increased enough these days that you can actually get eight terabyte drives that don't do shingling. But um, you can imagine that if you have shingling, you actually have to be very careful how you use it. So this is more for uh, either archival storage where you're not writing it very often or for something like uh, your TiVo where you're writing um, a big device or excuse me, you're writing a large video. And so you essentially just go around many times for the video and so you, you don't tend to uh, write this randomly, and you can basically uh, write over big chunks of, uh, of tracks at a time for a particular video. So uh, now we can um, briefly do a uh, performance model here. So let's, let's uh, sketch this out a little bit. So the heads uh, are tied together, and there's a, there's a head on the top and the bottom, and um, Tracks are uh, a ring on a particular surface. Uh, sectors are the minimum thing that you can read and write. And then this uh, cylinder is sort of all of the tracks on both sides of the platter that are on top of each other. Okay. So, uh, so basically, when we want to read data, it's, is there always one head per platter? Good question. Uh, pretty much yes. Uh, the other question, which nobody has asked yet, but I'll ask for you anyway, is, why are these heads all tied together? It seems like you'd want to independently move them um, so that uh, you could read and write off of different heads or different uh, surfaces at the same time. Can anybody think uh, of why that might be? So we have, it seems very hard slash space consuming. Yes, uh, physical limitations. Yes, you guys are kind of, um, going to the right answer there. More moving parts is error prone. Yep. So this actually, so all of what you say here is correct, but that isn't the reason they don't do this. They could. The answer is that um, actually these are commodity items. So disk drives are so commodity and the heads are such uh, complicated, expensive positioning motors and so on that um, it would just be too expensive and it wouldn't be worthwhile and nobody would buy them. And so, um, when would you read multiple heads at once? Well, you've got multiple processes running and they want to write, read different things. You could imagine wanting to read different parts of the disk at the same time. Uh, they, they just don't allow that because it's just too expensive. So it's really a cost reason. And that, you know, all of the things that people said here where they're talking about physical limitations and more moving parts and so on, those all relate to the bigger cost. Now, our, our three-stage process here, though, is uh, seek time, which is the time it takes to move the head into the right cylinder, rotational latency, which is then the time it takes for the, uh, the sector you want to rotate under the head, and then transfer time, which is the time once you've gotten the uh, sector in the right place to read all the data. 
okay? And the seek time of modern disks is uh, like um, four to eight milliseconds is pretty common, somewhere in there, that range, maybe three in some cases. Uh, the rotational time, one rotation is typically eight to 16 milliseconds. All right, um, and uh, that's because we've got about 3,600 to 7,200 revolutions per minute. That's a pretty common uh, type of device you might have in your laptops. All right, um, and once you've got sort of these pieces, then you could say the following, that the latency of the disk is uh, what you see in this diagram here. So the request comes in from the operating system, or excuse me, from the user, and it's queued. So this might be a software queue in the operating system or a queue in the device uh, driver itself, which is part of you know, the lower part of the operating system. Uh, that queuing time is uh, an interesting aspect we'll have to talk about in a moment. Um, and then there's the time to get into the controller. Okay, And then there's the time to the disk. So these two components, the queue and the controller, are totally independent of the actual device itself. Uh, and so uh, once you get into the device, then it's seek time plus rotational time plus transfer time, all right? And by the way, if you think of this probabilistically, this rotational latency, what's the average time it takes for us to get a, uh, to the, to the um, sector we want once we've, rotate, once we've gotten to the right track? Can anybody guess? So the question is, repeating the question, this seek time, we need to know the average time to get to the cylinder. Okay, you could imagine coming up with some average. Rotational latency has something to do with how long once we get to the, the cylinder, how long does it take to get to the sector we're interested in? And then transfer time is once we've gotten to the sector, how long does the transfer take? And that transfer time has something to do with uh, where we are on the disk because it's how fast is the media flying by the head. So that transfer time uh, we could uh, figure out. But what about this rotational latency? Can, it, can anybody guess how we might compute rotational latency? So we know the speed of rotation. Yep. Yeah. So it was very good. Time for this to go halfway around. That's right. So whatever the uh, time per revolution is, we would take half of that, and that's what we'd plug in for uh, rotational latency. How does the head know it's hit the right sector? Boy, you guys are asking some good questions. So the answer is uh, this sector has a header and some data. And that header is a self-synchronizing uh, thing so that when the head comes by, it reads the, uh, the address of the sector in the header, and then it knows that the data that's coming by or that it's about to write is uh, going to go in that sector. So, um, so that's part of the, uh, the process of formatting the disk. All right. And then the other question was, how does the device driver, or does scheduling really matter? And the answer is yes. So scheduling of what blocks we read and when really matters, and that's going to impact in a great uh, fashion, how fast the disk drive works. And so if you look at the complexity of uh, file systems, which we'll get to next time, so a lot of that complexity has to do with this uh, weird device here that we have to make sure that we almost never move the head in and out because that's really expensive. And we'd prefer to basically but put the head there and, and spin around and grab a whole file uh, because that's the fastest thing to do. All right. Now here's some typical numbers. So uh, 14 terabyte Seagate drive, that's a pretty uh, common thing now. Um, easy to get if you're a, if you're a cloud service provider. Um, typically eight platters and three and a half inch form factor. Okay, and uh, greater than a terabit per square inch on the platters. So that's just crazy. And they also suck out the air in there and replace it with helium to make it uh, less resistance to spinning. Okay, so they're trying to reduce the uh, reduce some of the energy lost uh, to the actual spinning of these devices. Okay, the average seek time is in the four to six millisecond range. Depending on uh, where you are and where you're going, uh, 
it could be 25 to 33 percent of this number. So this is where scheduling of the device driver really matters or the file system is uh, rather than four to six milliseconds, you'd like to get uh, a much lower um, amount. And that's basically the file system. We schedule things so we don't move very much. All right. Um, average rotational latency, I told you this, 3,600 to 7,200 RPM gives us uh, somewhere between 16 to 8 milliseconds. Um, and however, server disks get up to 15,000 uh, RPM, so those are very fast. Um, the average latency for these regular disks that we talked about is half of that, uh, 16 to 8 milliseconds, and so it's 8 to 4 milliseconds. And then transfer time, 250 megabytes per second, common, right? Um, compare that in your mind to one megabyte per second in the original IBM uh, disk, quite a bit faster. Okay, now, uh, let's see. So I'm going to um, give us about, uh, let's give us a brief break so people can uh, uh, run off for a second and I'll be back momentarily and uh, we'll continue. All right, so we're going to talk about SSDs. Yes, in just a moment. That was a question uh, in the break. And so um, let's finish up with disks here. So I wanted to give you uh, an example here. We're going to ignore the uh, uh, queuing and controller time for the moment. Um, and uh, average seek time of five milliseconds, um, 7,200 RPM. So how do we? deal with that. Uh, so there is a question, by the way, on the channel saying that I'd uh, love to hear about SSD file systems. Uh, yes, we'll see if we can talk a little bit about that too um, next time. But um, so if we have a 7200 RPM disk, then the time for rotation is, and this is where units matter, so hopefully you remember from your high school chemistry uh, the importance of units. And so for instance, that's 60,000 milliseconds per minute divided by 7200 uh, Revolutions per minute gives me about eight milliseconds. So you could do that computation. Okay, and the 60,000, you can figure out where that came from, right? That's uh, 60 uh, seconds per minute, et cetera, and 1,000 milliseconds per second. The uh, transfer rate of, say, 50 megabytes per second and a block size of four kilobytes. So notice that what I'm doing in my um, example here of, uh, this example is I'm actually putting a bunch of sectors, which might be 512 bytes together into four kilobyte chunk, which I'm gonna assume is along the same track and together. And so we can just basically, once we've positioned ourselves and we've rotated the right spot, then we can just read, okay, all of them at full speed. And so how do we uh, transfer four kilobytes? Well, that's uh, four, 4096 bytes, okay? And remember that for data, this is, uh, really a kibby byte, right? So it's 4,096 bytes divided by 50 times 10 to the 6 bytes per second. So this is a bandwidth, so that's not in uh, MIBIs. <laughs> uh, and then um, we basically uh, compute that out and we get about 0 0.082 milliseconds to get, um, to get our block, okay? And uh, the question here is, do seek time and rotation time overlap? The answer is no. Now, can you figure out why we can't overlap seek and rotation given what I said earlier? It's a great question. Anybody have an answer for that one? Nope, it's not about dollars. Yeah, great. So you need to find the header. That's right, so you only after you seek, then you, as the disk is spinning, you're sort of looking at each header on the track to decide when you're at the right spot. So you can't actually start looking for the sector until you've moved in, all right? And so now we read the block from a random place on the disk. We have the seek of five milliseconds. A rotational delay is four milliseconds. Why four? Because that's half of the eight that we computed. Transfer. 0.082 milliseconds, and so that basically gives us 9.082 milliseconds. So uh, you could say it's approximately nine milliseconds to fetch and push data of uh, 4096 bytes uh, divided by the time. And so what we're really getting there in this particular situation is 451 kilobytes per second. 
So uh, notice what I've computed here. Assuming that we're randomly writing a 4K block anywhere on the disk, the best we could do is 451 kilobytes per second, even though the transfer rate off of the head is high, right? So look at the difference. 451 kilobytes per second versus 50 megabytes per second. So this is showing us how bad it is to keep ran reading a random block off the disk, okay? So on the other hand, if we don't have to seek and we're gonna just read from a random place in the same cylinder, then the only thing we have to worry about in that case is waiting for the block to show up uh, by rotating. And so um, the rotational delay is four milliseconds, transfer time is 0 0.082 milliseconds, which gives us 4.082 milliseconds to do that read, which has gotten, if we keep doing that over and over again, that's 1.03 megabytes. Okay, so the answer, there was a question of why four milliseconds instead of eight. And again, this eight is the time for a complete rotation, but we're gonna assume that probabilistically on average, when we pop into a track, we only have to wait half a rotation to get, uh, get what we're going on. So this is a, an on average, it's four milliseconds. Okay, and um, so if we wanna read the next block on the same track, then uh, we don't have to do any uh, seek or rotational uh, transfer time, or rotational time, excuse me, and it's just the transfer time, and that's our 50 megabytes per second. So you can see this progression here, 451, one uh, kilobytes, one megabyte, 50 megabytes, and so there's a significant advantage to locality. All right, so the key to using the disk effectively is uh, to minimize seek and rotation delays, and so when we get into file systems for disks, we're gonna have to talk about that. Okay, any questions before I go on? Okie dokie. So there's a lot of intelligence in the controller. So sectors uh, have all sorts of sophisticated error correcting codes. And so the disk uh, basically is able to correct all sorts of errors automatically. Um, there's a wider field than the track. So when you're writing, you're sort of messing up bits on either side. And so there's a complex DSP to, and error correction to fix that. Um, Sector sparing, basically automatically the controller figures out bad sectors and will do replacements. And so when the operating system's asking for particular sectors these days, they're uh, typically asked for in a virtual sense and the controller might actually be replacing the sector you thought you were getting with a different one because of errors. Um, there's also uh, remapping a, a whole range of sectors uh, to preserve sequential behavior. So these are other things that controllers might do. Track skewing, so sector uh, numbers offset from one track to ne uh, the next to help with moving and, uh, and um, getting high speed uh, even when you're sort of rotating your way in and moving uh, seeking. So there's a lot of interesting intelligence that's been built up over the years. And so it's not the case that you typically say, well, um, I know exactly what track I need to go to and what's, you know, sector and so on. And you're going to optimize exactly for that because in many cases, the controller has a different view of how sectors are numbered. Um, it is interesting to see that disk prices have basically uh, been falling kind of with a Moore's law growth rate, although they've, they've sort of fallen off a little bit um, over the last couple of years, but uh, they're still pretty, pretty dense. Uh, part of the problem is uh, it used to be that there was a big issue of people worrying about uh, the bytes getting so small on the disk, the, the bit storage on the disk getting so small that uh, mere heat would cause the data to go away. Uh, but there's been a variety of new ways of sort of doing vertical storage of uh, vertical magnetic domains inside to uh, really take care of that. And so some of what has tailed off these days has really been that, uh, you know, industry can make huge disks that uh, people can't necessarily even use because they're so big. Um, so I just wanted to give you a couple of examples of things here. So the Seagate uh, Exos uh, X14 I mentioned earlier has a 14 terabyte hard disk, eight platters, 16 heads in this little tiny device. It's got helium filled to reduce friction. Uh, it's got a 4.16 millisecond seek time. Um, 
one of the trends that's happened over the last five years or so is that uh, 512 byte sectors, which were pretty much the norm for decades, have now started to get bigger because the disks are so big. And so actually on some of these newer drives, you can't even write a 512 uh, byte sector anymore. It's just a 4K sector. And as I mentioned earlier, nobody was using the 512 uh, byte granularity anyway. They have typical uh, high speed, like six gigabit per second or 12 gigabit per second. That's SAS two or three uh, interfaces. And the price might be about $615, which uh, if you look, that was about $0.05 uh, dollars per gigabyte as opposed to the old IBM uh, PC, which uh, was basically $17,000 uh, per gigabyte. So uh, you can see <laughs> there's a big difference there. Uh, obviously, disks are a lot cheaper. Um, so let's talk about solid state disks. So solid state disks are um, basically made out of special flash memory and then uh, oftentimes put into uh, a form factor that you can plug in uh, to the same interfaces as a regular disk. And so back in 1995, they started replacing uh, disks with uh, these battery backed up DRAM cells. But then around uh, the late 2000s, uh, NAND flash became very dense. And uh, so then they started using flash. And the good thing about flash is there's no moving parts. Uh, it eliminates the seek and rotational delay, uh, low power, downside is limited write cycles, all right? Now, uh, rapid advances in capacity. In fact, I have a really fun uh, flash drive I'll show you in a moment. But um, so the basic architecture is inside the flash drive is a bunch of these NAND flash devices and a memory controller that um, basically is busy figuring out how to do what's called wear leveling so that we only we don't overwrite uh, individual cells too often um, because uh, if we do, we wear them out. And so the flash controller is taking the uh, file system's request for data and putting a virtual layer on it and actually writing to its own notion. There's a translation table inside the SSD to decide sort of which cells get used. And that's all done in a way that's transparent pretty much to the computer you plug it into. Okay, and uh, typically it'll read uh, a 4K byte page in about 25 microseconds, so that's pretty fast. Okay, so there's no seek, no rotational latency. Transfer time uh, to transfer a 4K page uh, might be about 10 microseconds. Okay, um, and notice also that um, these uh, 4K pages are something that you might find a little surprising. So we're still reading and writing in four kilobyte size chunks even though you could say, well, these are just you know, single bits at a time, but that interface of a page at a time is uh, used because the devices themselves are organized uh, in a page at a time, okay? The latency here uh, for this device is gonna be queuing time plus controller time, just like with the disk plus transfer time, which is different. And random access is gonna be fine with these, right? It's not a big deal to read one part as opposed to another because there's really no seek or rotational latency. So there's no advantage to locality other than within a block. Um, so the highest bandwidth on this device is sequential or random. Okay. Um, now, uh, so the question here is if flash memory controllers also have to worry about balancing writes, are they notably slower than disk controllers? Now, the, um, the thing that's really limiting all of these is the speed of reading and writing the, uh, the individual bits themselves. And so um, this, this uh, controller that's doing this is not, the, is not the limiting piece in most cases. Now what it does do is occasionally it will be transferring data around to rebalance things. And, and those circumstances, you can actually run into a situation where you wanna read or write and you're being held up because the controller itself is reading or writing. So that is one uh, possible cause for things to be a little slower than you might expect, but it's still a heck of a lot faster than uh, disks. So writing data is pretty complicated, okay? Because you can only write empty pages in a block. And so yes, here we have a 4K, um, block 
Uh, we can only write 4K at a time, but then we have to erase a whole chunk of blocks at a time. So we have to erase, say, 256K bytes at a time. And once we have erased uh, a bunch of, of chunks that are uh, co-located in the physical device, then we can start writing them. And so part of the process that we have to do in order to have a solid state drive is that um, we have some number of uh, groups of er erased pages that are ready to go. And so the controller is busy making sure that it has a free list of chunks of erased pages. And when those chunks run out, it's got to erase some blocks to get more chunks. And so part of the interface between the file system and the SSD has to be to tell the SSD controller which blocks are no longer in use so it can put them on the free list, gather them up and put together groups of empty uh, 256K blocks, for instance, and then go through an erase process before you can reuse those blocks for something else. I'll say a little bit about how the SSD works in a second in just a slide, so hold that off for a sec. So erasing the whole chunk of a block here is a 1.5 milliseconds. Writing is faster. Um, controller has to maintain a pool of empty blocks. And uh, writes are about 10x the time for reads. Erasure is about 10x the time for writes. And so erasing things is definitely a slow process here, but it's still a lot faster than uh, DRAM. Um, the, uh, I guess I don't have a figure uh, for, the, for what's going on here, but basically the question is how the SSDs physically work. And the answer is that um, there's a set of parallel, uh, so they're exactly like transistors, uh, NAND flash, uh, with the ex uh, exception that there's a um, two uh, basically plates that are separate from each other with a um, with an insulator between them, and the write process traps uh, electrons basically on one of them, and then you can notice that they're trapped there. And erasing basically raises a um, raises a voltage high enough to drive those electrons off. And so really the reason the high, the write rate is so high is you're basically shoving electrons across a, an insulator to get them to be trapped and there, thereby sort of indicate a one or a zero. Um, I guess I don't actually have a picture of, so basically you're charging and discharging capacitors. Not quite because it, it looks like a capacitor except that you're basically shoving things across uh, a capacitor plate. And so you basically have to get it high enough to uh, drive the, electrons across something that's not actually a conductor. So it's a little different than a capacitor. Um, I wanted to show you, uh, here's a typical SSD drive that you can go and buy from Amazon without too much trouble. Um, it's say 15 terabytes, uh, so it might be a $6,000 drive, uh, about $0.41 uh, per gigabyte, so that's not too bad. Um, this is the one I wanted to show you. This one you still can't quite buy, but this is the Nimbus. It's 100 terabytes. Um, it's got 12 dual 12 gigabyte interfaces, uh, can write very rapidly. And it says you, it'll give you, as a guarantee, unlimited writes for five years. Uh, can anybody figure out why uh, a company could offer unlimited writes for five years, even though uh, flash wears out as you write it? Yeah, so um, both, there's two comments here that are essentially correct, yes. They know they have their wear leveling working well, and if you think about it, there are so many blocks in here that they could write continuously for five years and not touch every block in here. And so the company here can say for a fact that it doesn't matter how hard you write, uh, our wear leveling is just gonna basically keep redirecting you in a way that um, it won't uh, wear out. And I wanted to point out that, by the way, I tried last year when I was teaching this class to find out what the price of this thing was going to be. And uh, there was speculation about 50K uh, for this guy. But um, who knows? It's still not available. The question is, what's the difference between a NASA a SATA SSD and a PCI SSD? So the difference is the SATA SSD here looks just like a disk drive and runs the disk drive inter interface, whereas the um, PCI SSD is a slightly different interface, looks more like memory. OK. Um, let's see, SSD prices keep dropping, and so things are looking uh, 
like at some point SSDs might cross over, but hard disks uh, in terms of price per byte, but um, hard disks still somehow keep going uh, forward. And, you know, this 100 terabyte device is pretty cool and it's a very small form factor, but it's still really, really expensive. Um, all right. Um, I wanted to show you an amusing calculation. Uh, so the question here is Kindles, uh, which are, believe it or not, specialized reading devices. I don't know if you guys have uh, even seen those anymore, but I happen to love them because you can sit in the sun and read. Um, you might ask the question, uh, is an empty Kindle heavier than, uh, or is, is a full Kindle heavier than an empty one? And so here's the experiment. You get a Kindle from Amazon, it's got no books on it, and then you, uh, you add all the books in to fill it up. And the question is, is it heavier when you're done? And the answer is actually yes. Okay, now what was funny was uh, somebody from the New York Times forwarded this question to me uh, once upon a time and uh, for one of their little uh, science columns. And uh, the answer is yes, but it's, uh, you gotta be very careful about what you mean when you're saying this. So flash, works by trapping electrons. And so when you trap electrons, uh, you're basically raising the energy of uh, the transistor by trapping electrons in it, because that's a higher energy state. And so the erase state has lower energy than the written state. Um, and assuming that at the time you could get your Kindle with a four gigabytes of flash in it, um, half of all the bits in a full King, uh, Kindle are in the high energy state. This is just saying that when you have books, it's a random set of ones and zeros. You do a little bit of a calculation. You use E equals MC squared for the energy to mass conversion. And what you come up with is that a full Kindle is about one atogram heavier uh, than an empty one. And now what's an atogram? That's 10 to the minus 18th gram. <laughs> um, the most sensitive scale you can find out there is 10 to the minus 9th gram. So you can decide whether this is heavier or not. Um, there's, also, there's also a um, lot of uh, caveats to this. Like for instance, um, if the thing is warmer, that will add more weight than, uh, than this 10 to the minus 18 grams. Or if you wear the battery down, the energy lost to the battery will make it much lighter than what you gained in weight. So the only way you can really even do this experiment is you take the Kindle, you uh, fill it with books, then you cool it back down and recharge it so it looks exactly the same as it did when you started the process. Um, and then you do that measurement, which you can't actually do because it's too late. But anyway, so this is an amusing calculation. Um, you can actually look this up for, in October 24th, 2011. Uh, what's uh, amusing about, and I, I did um, confirm this with uh, a number of my colleagues and so on. What's amusing about this situation is right after we published this amusing little calculation, suddenly everybody in the world was talking about how heavy the internet was. And so somebody came up with uh, a calculation that the internet was uh, the weight of a, a strawberry. And, and he had a whole video that he posted. And uh, that was um, rather amusing. But you, you guys should uh, check that out. Some of that may still, still be up. And uh, by the way, this calculation is only doable because we're extraordinarily careful about what we say. And we set up a, a careful experiment uh, none of the things that claim that the internet is the weight of a strawberry make any sense. <laughs> um, so the summary for SSDs here, the pros uh, versus hard drives is very low latency, high throughput, no seek or rotational delay, no moving parts, very lightweight, low power, silent, shock and sensitive. Uh, you can essentially read at memory speeds. Um, you could imagine that the file system that uh, you set up for an SSD might be completely different than the file system you set up for a disk drive. We'll talk a little bit about that. Some of the cons are the storage is relatively small and expensive relative to disks, but it's catching up. Um, I don't remember the last time I bought a laptop with an actual spinning storage in it. Um, I always buy SSDs now because they're big enough for what I need for a laptop and uh, they're much more reliable and lower power. And so, um, you know, spinning storage is still used a lot in, um, uh, still used a lot in uh, cloud places, you know, cloud computing areas and so on. But, uh, you know, I think for a lot of the portable devices, definitely SSDs are it. 
Um, certainly, uh, things are no longer small. Okay, so that's uh, important. Um, one of the cons is this an asymmetric block write performance. So writes are more expensive than reads. And by the way, you have to have a bunch of spare ones that you've erased. So that's a little different. Um, there's a limited drive lifetime because uh, if you write too much on a given cell, you wear it out. So uh, average failure rates about six years. Life expectancy might be nine to 11 years. Uh, but all of this stuff keeps changing. Okay. Um, I did want to point out, by the way, that there's a lot of really cool alternatives. So the thing about Flash is Flash is uh, basically non-volatile. So when you turn the power off, you don't lose any data, just like with a disk drive, but it's kind of more like memory. Okay. However, what's very interesting is that um, you can do better. And there are a lot of interesting ones. One of the ones I think is pretty cool is there's a company called Nantero. And they have nanotube memory. So what you see here is uh, a carbon nanotube looks actually like this, where there's carbon atoms at all of the different uh, space, uh, spots here, dots. And um, they can basically set up a situation with a crosshatch three-dimensional set of nanotube uh, cells where um, there's a difference between um, one state where electricity can go through fairly quickly in another state where it's broken up a bit. So that's the difference between a one and a zero. And you can rewrite it over and over again. There's no uh, wear out. And it's potentially as fast as DRAM um, and potentially denser. So they are, we're actually talking about maybe getting more data than DRAM could per physical chip. Uh, so this, uh, this is kind of exciting and uh, exciting enough that if this were ever to take off, there's a couple of other technologies. If any of them were ever to take off, we might not have DRAM anymore and just have non-volatile RAM. And so pretty much none of your data would ever uh, go away even in memory. And that's gonna change the way people build operating systems and uh, the way that they build um, you know, storage systems if all of your memory everywhere is always non-volatile. Okay, so um, next time, so there was a question on here. Let's see. So there's, uh, you know, a question on um, how does, uh, what are a lot of different technologies? There are other ones, by the way, where they actually have um, magnetic domains. I don't know if you remember at the beginning of the term, I kind of talked about core memory, which were these little lifesaver-like things that would have a charge or have a, um, a uh, magnetic field or not, and that would give you a one or a zero. So there's a version of that that they've shrunk down um, to, uh, to the size of chips that's being looked at. There's the nanotube memory. There's a, there's a um, phase change memory where you, uh, there's two phases of the material in here, a crystalline one and a melted one, and that's another way to get ones and zeros. So I think there's a lot of exciting things on the way. All right. So next time we're going to talk about performance a little bit more, um, but you know one of the things we're going to have to worry about here is in this user thread versus queue versus control versus IO path, what are the most important things? And as we get through that, we're going to have to confront this curve, which is the queuing curve. Uh, we're going to figure out a little bit of where that comes from and uh, talk about how to confront that. Okay, so it's not just the device itself or the controller, but also the queue itself is gonna cause uh, um, an important part of our response time. And we're gonna to wanna to make sure that we're not at the point where the curve really starts going up uh, rapidly, but rather more in this uh, linear region down there. Okay, so in conclusion, we've been talking a lot about disks, uh, queuing time plus controller plus seek plus rotational plus transfer time, the rotational latency being a half of a rotation transfer time uh, based on how fast things are rotating and what's the bit density of the disk. Um, we talked about how uh, devices have a very complex interaction and performance characteristics um, where the response time is queuing plus overhead plus transfer time, for instance. Um, for hard disks, queuing plus controller plus seek plus rotation plus transfer. We talked about SSDs instead where you don't have the seek and rotation, but you have to worry about erasure and wear out. 
um, file systems are going to be designed to optimize this. And so next time we're going to talk more about that queuing component, and then we're going to dive into some file systems, and we're going to talk about um, how are file systems designed to basically deal with these response time characteristics. And um, fundamentally, what's the difference about an SSD file system will come up. Um, so that'll be something that comes up. Um, and uh, bursts and high utilization are also going to uh, introduce queuing delays that we're going to have to confront. You know, one of the things I uh, didn't talk about was midterm two. We're going to give you more information about that on the uh, Piazza, so watch for that. Um, I hope you guys have a great um, have a great couple of days, and uh, we'll see you in Thursday's lecture. All right. Talk to you later.